Well, this morning before we start, I am going to ask for your forgiveness beforehand. Um, it's been a tough message to write this week, and you'll understand why in a few. And I'm very emotional. I already preached it in Spanish, so I came out of there more emotional. So if I get emotional this morning, I'm not trying to imitate Pastor Brian. I'm just... <laughs> Uh, I'm just emotional today, but I'm glad to be here with you this morning, and I hope you're glad to be here today, serving the Lord and praising His name. What a great time of worship that was. All right, we can edit that part out, now I can start. <laughs> well, 10 days ago, 10 days ago I was home, preparing for what inevitably would be a great, great week in the Santiago household. We uh, were waiting for the call from the gate. The Uber driver was going to deliver the, pa the package and I was anxiously awaiting to see my granddaughter, Alessandra Marie. I think we have her up there somewhere. There she is. I know what you're saying. I get all the cute granddaughters. It's okay. I understand. Don't be jealous. Right, Maya? Don't be jealous. <laughs> So they came in and I, I, as soon as I got the call from the gate, I ran out of the house, um, supposedly taking luggage out of the car, but I'm just making believe so I can wait until the baby comes out of the car, you know. And, and of course, I was glad to see my son and his wife, but, you know, I just pushed them to the side. I'm here waiting for the baby to come out. And the baby comes out and, of course, she is sleeping like a rock. She's completely out. I mean, it's like if nothing was happening. It's like she wasn't even excited that I was excited. She didn't even know I was there. But yes, I had to wait a long time to carry her and start our new relationship because the last time I saw her, she was two months old. So now we're starting all over again and she doesn't even like me right now. But it's okay. I got one that likes me and I love her. So I'll work on the other one little by little. Hopefully it won't take me 13 years, right? But um. <laughs> but have you ever experienced that kind of excitement in your life? Have you ever experienced where something really good is going to happen and you're all excited and life is going to be good? And I had taken vacation, uh, which we need to talk about that. It was no vacation. But, but I was off from work and uh, life was going to be good. This 10 days was going to be exciting. And, and, and I had a good weekend. I had a good Monday with my family. But Tuesday... I get a call from Brian early in the morning and I'm like, I'm on vacation. And he gives me some horrible news. Brian is on the phone and says, Jose, your friend, your church attender has taken his life. And I said, no, no, Brian, I'm sorry, you're wrong, Brian, not him. He's like, yes, Jose. I'm like, listen. You're wrong. Have you ever been there? You get kind of upset. I was getting kind of upset with Brian that morning. And I'm like, Brian, it's wrong. I need to verify this. I mean, in my mind, if that would have happened, they would have called me first. Not him. So I know he was wrong. And I call his wife and she didn't answer the phone. And I call my worship leader who is this guy's best friend. And I said, Ramon, did you hear this? Is this true? And he didn't know about it. So now we're both going crazy. But unfortunately, what was supposed to be a beautiful week turned into a week filled of anguish and pain and suffering and questions and turmoil. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in the place where you think life is going to be good? Finally, I hit the happy life. And all of a sudden, it all comes crumbling down. And happiness, triumph turns to tragedy and hope turns to despair. Someone said that we're living in the, what he calls the cardiac age. The cardiac age. He says everybody has a troubled heart. But the Bible says... Let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts 
betrothed. Maybe you're a single mother this morning wondering how to be a good parent and a good provider. Maybe you're a parent or a grandparent worried and agonizing over the rebellion of your children or your grandchildren. And maybe you're recently divorced and you're facing life with one income and double the obligations and trying to wonder how we're going to make it. Maybe you got an addiction and you keep trying and trying to break it and you can't. Maybe you're a student looking at the horizon of your future and you can't make a decision. And all you feel is fear and anguish and you're feeling overwhelmed. Maybe you're sick and you consider a myriad of treatment options and What is the answer, right? What is the answer to the turmoil inside of us when something like this happens? How, how do we face this turmoil in our life? And, and our passage today this deals with this issue and, and it, 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 it gives us like a simple answer. I mean, Jesus in one sentence gives us the problem and the answer. And he says that the answer is to believe. To have faith. Now let us remember that John stated his purpose for writing his letter in chapter 20. And he said that the purpose of the letters, he says, these are written so that you may believe. But he wasn't talking about believing in anything. He's not believing in some kind of energy out there. Or yeah, something bigger out there. No, 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 no. He said that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name, even in the midst of the anguish. Today's passage is a very practical passage. I'm going to be reading a lot. And the reason I'm reading is because my mind is all over the place, really. So uh, forgive me for that. But it's very practical, especially for those of us who have this tendency to have what I'm going to refer to today as unholy turmoil or a troubled heart. Many of us have this tendency to worry, to fear, and to allow that to take us. And I'm calling a holy term or the one that is based on fear or on unbelief. Not, not the one that is based on love. I mean, we've we, we seen Jesus have, be troubled in spirit in, in spirit in chapter 13. And that's what John Piper calls holy turmoil. But I'm talking about unholy turmoil today. The one that is based on fear. The, the one that is due to lack of trust. In God for the problems that we're facing. Maybe your heart is troubled this morning. Maybe you are experiencing a holy, unholy turmoil. Maybe you're questioning God like right now. Man, I had a lot of questions this week. How hard is it? Two weeks ago, I'm preaching over there. We're talking about Lazarus resurrecting from the dead. And I made a statement. And I said, God is glorified even in death. And it sounded really good for the passage. But on Tuesday when I talked to this widow, the first thing she says is, oh, say, so how is God glorified today? Oh, that's a hard one to answer. Well, let's read what Jesus says in John 14. Verse 1, it says, Let's not, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way 
and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and that is enough for us. <laughs> Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Lord Father, would you, will you talk to us today through your word? Father, would you talk to us not only corporately, but specifically, personally to each one of us, Father? I pray especially for those of us who, whose heart is troubled this morning. And I would assume it's most of us, Lord. Help us to understand your word for us today, Lord. Speak to our hearts, I ask, in the name of Jesus. We see that Jesus in that first statement, he gives us the problem and the answer, right? He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. We have the problem. We have the answer. But the important thing here is that Jesus is not giving us a suggestion. See, the way this is written is written as an exhortation, as a command. This is my paraphrasing this morning. Stop. Stop what you're thinking right now and do not let your heart be troubled. Stop letting your mind wander with all these questions and do not let your heart be troubled. Now you see to understand why he's talking to the disciples that way, right? It's kind of weird. All of a sudden he comes out of nowhere. Stop. We will have to go back to chapter 13 and we're not going to read all of that. But I want you to understand why he's saying this. You see, for the disciples, everything was going good. They've been walking with Jesus for three and a half years. They've been seeing miracles. I mean, they just saw him feed 5,000 people plus and create food out of nothing. I mean, he was just making food. I mean, they're, they're looking and they're saying, wow, the only one that can create is God. And this guy's creating food. He's healing people. He's doing miracles all over the place. People want to make him king by force. Remember that? And they're saying, this is it, man. We're coming close to the time. We're going to take over. This guy is going to liberate us from the Romans. Life is looking good. But then chapter 13 comes. And that night after Jesus washed their feet and shared a meal with them, he starts talking to them. And he said, you know what, guys? One of you is going to betray me. Whoa. Whoa. Wait a second, it's 12 of us here, man. It's not like we have a 1,000 people, one is going to betray you, it's no big deal. We're talking about 12 that have been hanging out together for three and a half years. One of us is going to, what, betray you? Oh, yeah, and by the way, I'm leaving, and where I'm going, you can't go. <laughs> but wait a second, we're just going to take over the kingdom here, and you're going to leave? Oh, and by the way, your leader, Peter, he's going to disown me before the sun even comes out tonight. Can you imagine what was going on through the hearts of these disciples? Could you imagine the trouble they're feeling inside? And it's in the midst of that that Jesus says, stop. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe in me. Wow. He says it twice. In verse 1, he says, believe in God, believe also in me. Then in verse 11 again, he says, believe me. He's basically telling them, listen, I know you just got some bad news, but you got to trust me. You got to trust me. 
And it's interesting. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. What he's basically saying is you got to trust me because I am God. See, we have to stop our mind from drifting when we are in anguish. And don't let our hearts be troubled. And we need to believe. Why? Because Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Look at verse 7. He says in verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And then in verse 8, when Phyllis asks, show us the father, he says, have, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me? He doesn't say you still don't know the father. He said, you don't know me. Jesus is God. So don't let your heart be troubled. Trust me because in trusting me, you're trusting God. He had told them in chapter 12, he had told them that he was God. He said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. See, and I understand that sometimes we know something up here. They knew it up here. They heard it. But then when it comes to the application, it's so hard. It's so hard to put the heart out there and believe it, Right? So how do we overcome unholy turmoil in our hearts? By believing in Jesus. That's the answer. That's why the Bible says we need to walk by faith and not by sight. Because it is impossible for us to understand all that troubles our heart. Just like it was difficult for the disciples to understand all that was going on. Why do you have to leave? Why now? Why this? Why him? Why her? We don't understand at all. But we got to walk by faith. Listen to me. Regardless of the situation you're facing this morning, regardless of the turmoil that is in your heart right now, regardless of how scary that situation looks, you need to trust God. You know, the only God-ordained fear in the Bible is fear of God. It's the only time the Bible says to fear something. Fear God. So this morning I want to tell you that if you're fearing anything else, you're fearing the wrong thing. The reason we fear other things is because we don't fear God. The reason we fear other things is because we don't trust God. And I'm telling you this morning, get your mind out of whatever is you're fearing this morning and put your fear in God. And submit yourself to God. And trust Him. Trust Him. 1 John 4 says, there's no fear in love. But perfect love, that's God. He casts out fear. So if you're experiencing unholy turmoil in your life at this moment, you're fearing the wrong thing. See, one of the problems I think we have with lessons like this, with messages like this, I think one of the issues we have with believing God is because what we understand that is good for us is different than what God understands is good for us. See, we need to trust that he has our best interest in heart. See, and that's difficult. I understand. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans 8.28. If you know me, you've heard me mention that verse a thousand times because it's one of my favorite verses. And it says like this. And we know that for those who love God, that's me, all things work together for good. And normally we stop there. Because it sounds good. You know, all things that I do, no matter what I do, works together for my good. What's my good? Well, maybe I, I get slimmer without having to do a diet. That's good for me. I get healthy without going to the doctor, right? Somebody just puts his hand on me. I'm healthy. That works for me. Maybe I get a new car or a new house. We think materially, right? When we think our good... We think material things, we think physical things, we think what is good for me. But you see, what is good for me is different. My definition is different than God's definition of what's good for me. 
See, that's the problem. So we got to read the whole verse. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to what? His purpose. Not my purpose. His purpose. And what is God's purpose in our life? Let me tell you, God's purpose in your life is to conform you to the image of Christ. That's his purpose. See, and then what this means then is that all things that happen in my life, yes, good, bad, will work out to conform me to the image of Christ. See, when my sister talked to me on Tuesday, and she wanted an answer to that question, so how is God glorified in this? I didn't answer I was wise, I think. I didn't answer. And then on Wednesday, I didn't answer it again. And she continues, continued to ask the question. But Thursday came around. And as we were sitting in her living room, she said, Pastor, would you pray for me? And I prayed for her. And before I finished the prayer, she started praying. At the beginning, I said, man, she's interrupting my prayer. And in her prayer, she said, thank you, God, because now I understand how your name will be glorified through this. See? And I wish you would have been here Friday night and Saturday morning. I wish you would have been at her house on Thursday night because she gave a clear presentation of the gospel that night. And she clearly stated that she trusts in God with her life. This is a person that was kind of questioning things. See, we don't understand all that happens. We can't, but we don't have to. When we get the troubled heart, stop. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust God. Now verses, 10, 12, uh, verses 2 to 10, Jesus is giving his disciples some support for his exhortation, for his command. You know, why should they not be troubled of heart? Why should we not be troubled of heart? And he gives them a couple of things. And he says, the first thing he says is that there is a place for you. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust me, because there's a place for you. He says in verse 2, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I will go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. There's room in the father's house for you. My friends, this morning, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can do it this morning. And I'm telling you, there's room in my Father's house for you. There's room. There's plenty of room for all of us. Accept him this morning. There is room for you. Now, when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a room for you, he doesn't mean, listen, I, I need to go and clean it and wash it, you know, like my wife would do if we're vis- somebody's visiting. She'd be like, oh, we got to get that place ready for them. It, means that, it doesn't mean that there's construction to be done and Jesus had to leave and it's taking him a couple of thousand years to finish the construction. That's not what it means, okay. And I know it's not because in Matthew 25, 34, he says, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. You see, the place has been ready. Since the foundation of the world, the place for you, the place for me has been ready. What I believe this means is that at this time, at this particular time when Jesus is talking to his apostles, to his disciples, at that time Jesus had not yet paid the wages of sin, which was death. At that time, the condemnation and the wrath of God and the curse were still unsatisfied. 
See, at that time, Jesus was about to become the curse for us, but he hadn't become that yet. And he was about to bear our condemnation and dead was yet not defeated. See, but just in the following days, just in a few days later, Jesus paid the price for us. He paid the price for sin. He became the sacrificial lamb of God who through his death, his burial and his resurrection, he took away the sins of the world. And in doing so, he prepared the way for you and I to get to that place. See, because he is the way. He is the way. I think that's why when Thomas asked him, how can we know the way? He said, I am the way to the Father. I am the way to the Father. I am the truth of the Father that you need to know. And I am the life eternal that you're going to be spent with the Father. I am it. It is Jesus. His name is Jesus. So today we can trust. We can believe in Jesus. Like he told his disciple, believe in me because there's room for you at the place. Furthermore, Jesus says that our focus right now should be in the person and not the place. I don't know if you catch that, but in, in verse 3 he goes, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. He didn't say I will take you to heaven over there and drop you in the corner. I will take you to myself. See, our focus has to go from the place to the person. Because Jesus is the place. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And he is the place. Let me ask you, what makes heaven heaven? The presence of Jesus. And I love it. He says, so way I am, you may also be. His presence makes heaven heaven. It's not a place that is heaven over there. It's the presence of Jesus that brings us to heaven. So this morning, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust me. Trust that I am doing or have done all that is needed for you. For there is a place for you and I will come and take you to myself. That where I am, you will be also. And I will be dwelling together. That's what Jesus is telling us this morning. But you may say to me, well, Jose, that sounds really good, man. That's fantastic news for the future. You know, one day I'm going to be there. One day if I die or he comes back, I'm going to be in heaven. That's fantastic news. We all like that news. But you know, Jose, my turmoil is here today. My heart is broken today. My anguish is affecting me now. So what do I do now? What do I do until that place comes? I believe Jesus answers that in verse 16. I put there in your outline, Jesus left so that the Holy Spirit could come. Jesus left so that the Holy Spirit could come. And in John 14, 16, it says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Another helper to be with you forever. The Holy Spirit has come into your life if you're a Christian this morning. And he is with you always and forever. Okay, you don't get more of him tomorrow or less of him today. I don't care how you feel. Some people tell me, well, I don't feel like the Holy Spirit is with me today. Well, I don't care how you feel. He's there. Okay, most of the time all your feelings are wrong, by the way. <laughs> so don't go by them. The fact is that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is with you forever. And he is your helper. Verse 17 says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. And you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And look at verse 18. 
and I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Hmm. Isn't that great? Isn't that great to know? I don't have to wait for eternity future or what I consider eternity to die and go to heaven. No. I have God in me through the Holy Spirit right now. And that's why when a week like this happens, I can look up and say glory be to God. Because he's here. And that's why you and I can stop our mind from turning around and turning around and asking questions and not be troubled. Because you have the helper in you that will help you walk this path. So the antidote for our unholy turmoil is belief, is faith. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Believe that he came to die, to be buried, and to raise again on the third day. To defeat death, to defeat the grip of sin forever so that you and I could have a place in the Father's house. Could have assurance of our salvation in Jesus. And could have the comfort and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's why he's telling you this morning. And I know. I know many of us have heavy hearts. In a crowd like this, many of us must be going through things. I normally don't do this, but I want to challenge you with something this morning. I'm going to play a song. We're going to play a, a song up there. And I want you to pay strict attention to the lyrics of the song. You probably have heard the song a thousand times. You know, it's one of those things we sing with them or whatever and we don't pay attention. And if you've been questioning God lately, maybe you've been praying for your marriage and the marriage is still the same. Maybe you've been praying for your husband or your wife or your kids and your kids still doing the same thing. Your husband's still doing the same thing. Maybe you've been praying to, to break an addiction and things don't change. Maybe you're afraid. Maybe you have a doctor's appointment tomorrow that you're afraid to go to. Maybe a good friend died. Maybe a husband died. Maybe a father died. Maybe you're questioning things in your life right now. Would you do me a favor? As they play the music, would you come to the altar? And I know it's symbolic. You put that worry, that fear at the feet of Jesus this morning. And you say, Jesus, God, all I want to fear from today on is you. And I'm going to put all my fears in this altar. I'm going to leave them there. I'm going to walk away with the strength of the Holy Spirit, knowing that he can help me carry this turmoil in my heart. And let me go from unholy turmoil to holy turmoil this morning. Would you do that for me? I mean, it's not, obviously, this is not mandatory. You could do it at your seat. But I love symbolic stuff. I like to do things that, that to me mean something, and I think it will mean something to you. So as we play this song, would you come and please listen to the lyrics of the song. Go ahead, guys. <laughs> 